puts it before us, is good news about an eternal presence, an agency, and intelligence, wholly committed to who we are and who we shall become, wholly committed to our growth into what we are made to be, wholly committed to each person in their distinctiveness, patient, undemanding, and massively demanding. A God who offers us life, peace, presence to ourselves and to him, who offers a gift which, in T.S. Eliot's words, costs us not less than everything, and in another sense costs us nothing at all, because gift is what it is. Can the church begin to speak of these things and show these things? Yes, if it's prepared to acknowledge its own denials, its own refusals of faith, hope, and love. And if the church is also prepared to do a little bit of diagnosis of the denials of the society we live in, the denials that enslave us, that trivialize our understanding and our remembering and our wanting. Yes, if the church lives consistently and courageously in an awareness that the power that made us and redeemed us is a power devoted to the fullness of life. Faith and hope and love, these three, says St. Paul, are the heart of all our learning, all our growing. And the greatest is love, because once we have understood the nature of that to which we are present in its eternal, unchangeable radiance and glory, everything else falls into place. So, God help us learn that, and live it, and be a church that can be dependable, that can be patient, that can, above all, give the space for men and women to receive the joy it is God's purpose to share with us. As we anticipated, there have been a large number of questions that have been submitted and the Archbishop, in the ten minutes allowed, has uh, made an attempt to try to get uh, some of those questions into a form that he could do some justice to in this 30 minutes. And um, I've checked with him and the way he'd like to operate is that he will now take us through the questions as he has received them and interpreted them uh, and so it doesn't require any chairing in that sense. So, um, are you ready? Right, round two. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I'll deal with as many as I can, as best I can, but can't absolutely promise you won't be surprised to get through all of them. Um, now, there are a few that are, as it were, practical and local, and you will be the best answerers of those questions, but I'll just give a couple of thoughts on two or three of those. Here's a very interesting and searching one, I think. To what extent is the dependability of the church compromised by the ongoing reduction in clergy and widening of responsibility for more and more parishes? Another questioner asks, in view of falling attendances at village churches, is the way forward to amalgamate with other local Christian groups? And someone else wants to know how we can encourage and enable parish churches 
to adapt their buildings to today's realities. And I take those as connected because they're all about the actual practical forms of witness. The parish church in so many communities is a mixed blessing, but it's a blessing. It's a blessing because it, at its best, at its best, it speaks of continuity, welcome, a space where serious things can happen. And that's what makes the parish church a treasure. The difficulty often does come, as one of the questioners notes, when adapting that parish church to current needs becomes mired in the bureaucracy, long bureaucratic procedures when a wall needs replacing or a lead roof needs replacing with a better and cheaper material. I, yes, I, um, I am still a diocesan bishop, so I do know some of <laughs> these problems. But I think under that is a question how the church building becomes a witness of dependability. Now, that requires, and it's a challenge, a very high level of responsibility from worshipping congregations. The responsibility not only to sustain the presence of the body of Christ in a community, but in their own lives to show something of this. And that's difficult when there is a sense, and I know there's a sense throughout the Church of England, of a disconnection between the language about dependability and the feeling that a lot of communities are abandoned by the church in its national or wider decision-making bodies. And all I can say to that, and it would take a long time, I think, to discuss it fully and fairly, all I'd say to that is it remains true that the worshipping congregation, however small, in a particular place, has the invitation, the calling, to create, in whatever way they can, a place of welcome, a place which speaks of a longer time scale and a longer vision than most people work with. I hope with all my heart that we can find ways of improving our decision-making, our bureaucracy. I think that very often we are held up in our attempts to become more flexible there. And I think there are real and very specific challenges around about how we share buildings and resources with other churches. The bishop and I have talked quite a bit about this in this context and in others in the Church of England. It's certainly no very effective witness if the church comes across as divided and clinging to its divisions. Let me move on to some rather different questions. There are two, interestingly, about Islam. Um, oh, sorry, there's the other one. Yes, here we are. One question about the church needing to take, I quote, a firm stand against the Islamification of this country. Um, another asks, how do you love your neighbor if he hates you? Brackets, Islam. I'd caution against the use of a word like Islamification. The percentage of the population of this country that is Muslim remains very, very tiny. What I suspect people are worried about is a long-term, but well, two things, a long-term demographic shift in Europe with the growing numbers of an Islamic population and the perception that in this country